Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are listening to this. I'm Lucy Morris, and welcome to another episode of FlyingArcher.com. We have an amazing guest for you today, Jen Wong. Good morning. Good morning, Jen. Jen is a silversmith and was born in California. She and her husband now live in Philadelphia. And Jen has two grown kids and two rat terriers. Mm-hmm. And she's been yep. doing archery for 15 months. Correct. Jen, oh, glad I got that right. Um, and and really awesome. Jen, Jen loves shooting, competing, and learning everything about archery. Jen has been shooting since June of 2014, and her husband started a week later. They have both become instant addicts, and Jen now owns four bows, carbon, aluminum, Wood and a Mohegan, Mo, how do you say, Mon, Mongolian, Mongolian horse? Yeah, Mongolian horse bow. Mm-hmm. Jen is a silversmith and has had a passion of making jewelry since she was a little kid. We have a lot to discuss, and please welcome from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Jen Wong. Thank you for having me, Lucy. Hey, Jen, you're so welcome. I just gave a brief overview and bio. Jen, sit back, relax, take a minute or two, and just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into archery. Happy to. Uh, Our daughter, Nicole, is 24 now. And when she was a tiny, tiny girl, a toddler, uh, she always wanted to learn to shoot a bow. And where we lived in the Bay Area in California, it was not something that was on every street corner. And she wasn't in Girl Scout or or anything like that. She actually um, was an an ice skater and a dancer. And we did our best. Uh, We would look at at summer camp programs or anything, always with an eye to archery, but we just never found it. And Mm -hmm. lo and behold, uh, we move more than 3,000 miles, and she's now in her 20s and has (laughs) finished college and... I texted her one afternoon and said, do you want to get together for dinner? And she said, yeah, that would be great. And on Tuesday night, we shoot. So, you know, is it okay if you want to come along with us? Oh, yeah, that sounds so cool. It sounds great. And I went along with her and uh, her boyfriend at the time and met our friends that are my absolute brothers in archery now still um, up at B&A in Northeast Philadelphia. And I did. I, I was just fascinated, drawn in, um, fell in love with it immediately. Oh, that is so wonderful. Um... Well, Jen and I are going to sit back and talk about archery for about 20 minutes. If you're listening while you're driving your car, I will take the notes for you. And I will have the links <laughs> and resources on my blog, theflyingarcher.com. So keep your hand on the steering wheel and please enjoy. And here are um, a couple of ways to connect with Jen. Um, Jen has a Twitter account. It's at Jen Wong Silver. And her Facebook is, you know, the www.facebook.com. Titanian's Garden. Now, Jen, let's just start with, uh, what's your favorite bow? Oh, my favorite bow is my carbon. Uh, I have an NOCXT, and I use Uga limbs on it. It's very lightweight and has almost no vibration. And it's just beautifully balanced, shoots well, um, it's a pleasure, pleasure to use. Oh, that is wonderful. Do you have a favorite gadget that you like for your bow? Hmm. When I'm at full strength, I think the things that I like to tinker with that, that really are like the the last 5% uh, is my stabilizer and weights. I have a shrewd long rod made by Sam Newsom down in Virginia, and mm-hmm. it's uh, it's carbon also. And then I have um, the weights for down at the far end for the the nose of it. Um, 
that in not only are they cute because I got them in different colors, but it really helps me to balance at once I lift my bow and then settle. Um, when I have my stabilizer and weights perfectly set, balancing against uh, the, the mass of my bow, it's just perfect. It stops at exactly the right point, at the right pivot point. So stabilizer and weights. Oh, that just just actually feels wonderful just hearing you describe it, it too. So it sounds like uh, you're more into recurve, and and why is that? Oh, absolutely. I I am exclusively a recurve shooter. Um, I come from a a background. I've studied art history all of my life, so mm -hmm. I do like things that are traditional and authentic and um, the original design. And so um, to me, to me, shooting was shooting wood or longbow, barebow, um, something. And then I moved from there into um, more of the Olympic recurve. But as long as I can do it, I really like the authenticity of using my own strength, whatever that is, as much or as little, as that is, but it is my own, um, without resorting to to pulleys and, and things. On the other hand, I have friends that, you know, through injury or age or um, car accidents or whatever, can't shoot a recurve anymore, and they can shoot a compound, and that's wonderful. That it's it's the I would never want them to be denied the joy of shooting. So compound is great for them. And I've, I even have friends that have made the next step that they can't shoot their compound anymore, so they shoot a crossbow. And that's still great. Whatever mm -hmm. somebody shoots, all archery is great. And whatever makes them happy and, and fulfills what they want to do, I'm for it. I mean, it sounds like you've become a complete archery enthusiast in 15 months. Uh, well, starting probably the first time you shot an arrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so you've so you've traveled a little bit for competition. Where a have you been? Bit. Well, the furthest that we've been was going to Outdoor Nationals in Decatur, Alabama, and uh, I was not adequately prepared. I'm such a beginner. But I did get to meet um, friends that I had only had contact with uh, through social media. And um, I got to take in the entire experience. You know, mm -hmm. what are people shooting? How do they handle the weather, the wind, the equipment? Who's coaching? What's their style? Um, being there in person was just the greatest learning experience ever. And, of course, it's fun. It's like getting the band together, you know. When, whenever you can be with friends from far away and all together in one place doing something that you all love to do, it's the best. Um, I've also I shot the New York State uh, Tournament uh, immediately after Nationals, and that was um, in upstate New York, which I had always heard was gorgeous, but I'd never mm -hmm. been there. And so uh, I grabbed the dogs and went up there and loved it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to traveling more and, and getting to meet more of my friends in person. With your, your recent experiences here with um, competing, what's been your craziest weather day? I'm sorry, tell, ask again? Uh, what, what, is, what was your craziest weather day? Oh, Alabama, absolutely. Um, the the winds were 25 to 30 miles per hour with gusts up to 40. And oh my I'm only, I'm five feet tall. I weigh 113 pounds. And I shoot a 23-inch riser, um, 29 and a half pound draw. I'm a tiny person. And mm -hmm. 40 mile per hour winds was literally pulling my bow out of my hands. Um, wow. the, the, the rain was blowing sideways. Tents were blowing over. Um, the ground had a great drainage system. It was a, uh, a 
dedicated sports complex and they had the drainage underneath the grass. It was very sophisticated, but it was never designed for torrential downpours and a lot of water in a short period of time. So, of course, it became a mud slick oh. as well as so <laughs> thunder, lightning, rain delays, um, everything that you could pretty much um, expect to have to shake you uh, during a tournament we had at Nationals this year. That's what makes you a true archer. Absolutely. Earned my stripes on that one. Totally. And um, what's, what great archery books have you read? Coming to archery as an adult, um, you know, not coming into a Joad program or through a camp or something like that, um, and being a student of art history, um, actually some of the most useful books that I've read are not um, American-style recurve archery books, but um, one of them is um, a book dedicated to Japanese traditional, um, which is uh, entitled Kyudo. And I don't remember the, the full title, um, but... Uh, the art and practice of traditional Japanese archery. And another is um, Pilates for the outdoor athlete. Um, Pilates was a wonderful thing for me when I was recovering from my first hip replacement. That's when I had my first exposure to it. Um, and now, um, after, after shooting a year, you know, everybody finds where their strengths and weaknesses are. And and one of my weaknesses is that I have a tendency to arch my back. And I'm I'm trying very hard now to develop the discipline to flatten my back and then even more importantly hold it. And it's very difficult to keep your center flat while lifting your bow and doing what you want to do with your arms. Uh, it takes a great deal of strength and concentration. And so um, the Pilates for the outdoor athlete was very helpful in um, helping me develop my, my stance and exactly what muscles I want to use and not use um, mm -hmm. to, to get the desired um, result of being able to, to flatten my back and make my... Um, the bottom half of my body, this my stance, very firm. So the next time that I shoot in 40-mile-per-hour gusts, that hopefully I would have a stronger base and, and be able to shoot through it. There, There's also um, one can practice a stance just standing in line, like uh, to cash out at the grocery store. Oh, yeah, or, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. That's something my my martial arts teacher, you know, told me. Yes. I was like, oh, it applies to uh, archery, and actually, archery is also a martial art. It is. I'm nodding at my at my telephone. What was that? I'm nodding towards my telephone. Okay, it's mild back. Yes. Um, I'm ignoring mine. And what strategies do you have if your equipment breaks in a competition? Because I've had my plunger um, loosen and twist. I've had um, bolts fall out, rests fall off. Um, I very early developed, um, my, my strategy is to have a backup of everything. And, and I do, I, when I'm competing, I have literally um, not only a fully set up backup bow with everything um, set, I, identical draw, identical clicker, um, spacing, everything on the second bow is the same as the first. But um, I also have all of the parts. Um, anything that could break or fall off or become unusable on my bow, I have a spare string. The knock points are already tied on it. It's already stretched out. Um, I've become Girl Scout girl. 
um, just because of being so shaken by, by having something become unusable in the heat of competition. Mm-hmm. What, what's your worst breakage or equipment failure? When I was at Nationals and there was all that rain, um, mm-hmm. the um, serving on my string um, started to stretch out and move, and my oh knock my point moved with it. So all of a sudden, my knock point was not set anymore, and and my serving was accordioning. And oh, oh my god! I, oh 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 oh! I was <laughs> out of my mind. I was just out of my mind. I I was looking at my husband like, help me! He's like, I don't know <laughs> what to do for you. And and there was no time and I had spare strings but they didn't I didn't have the knock points tied on them yet. And I thought I was prepared. So it's like great. I have spare strings that I can't use. Um yeah. I have about forty five seconds until my next end until I have to get in line. So it's not like I would have time to measure and set and tie and burn um appropriate knock points. Um so yeah. I, I really, really learned. Wow. Yeah, I you know, I think even just like grabbing some dental floss making a, a knocking point um under those kind of situations would be hard to do. Well and it wouldn't help because it was moving on the string. So oh it, it, it needed the the serving would have yeah. needed to be taken off and completely redone. And of course since then I've learned to anchor the the serving through the string so that wet or not, it's not going to move. But at that time, I had a commercially made string, and, and they just wrapped it around. So, yeah, I, I got to learn more about string servings as well. <laughs> a very that kind awesome. friend um, afterwards uh, just uh, sat down, and, and uh, we were communicating by uh, chat. And, uh, I you know, there's things that you can read in books, and, and you can see about anchoring your string, but when a friend is telling you about how they do it, it, it just um, somehow brings it home that much more. Oh, it, it completely does. That's Something much, yeah. You um, you said one of your bows is the um, Mongolian horse bow. Do you ride okay. horses? No, um, because of my disability, I can't seat a horse. My hips don't move that way. Okay. But um, since I'm tiny, I I thought that um, a nice small horse bow would be a lot more manageable, both um, the size and the weight, um, compared to a longbow. Um, now, um, I don't think it would be that that big a deal um but also it's difficult for me to string my olympic recurves um they are literally um four inches taller than i am and Mm -hmm. and so it's a challenge and so i was thinking with my um traditional bow my one piece bow that i would get something smaller um and yet of an appropriate draw weight um and what what happened actually is that I bought a 35 pound draw bow, but I'm not really my my body length is not long enough to draw it to full draw, so I don't really get the full 35 pounds. Yeah. And now it it feels like a toy. Um, it didn't feel <laughs> that way the day I bought it. Um, yeah. And actually, I I bought the horse bow because it is one a, a beautiful thing. It's made by Susan Morrison. Um, down in um, D.C. And her, na- her day job is for NASA. <laughs> and, oh. and she's also a bowyer. So that's sort of delightful in itself. But um, I wanted a bow that I could shoot at SCA events, um, Society for Creative Anachronism. And so mm-hmm. I didn't want to just paint up and fake a, a wood recurve. I wanted a real actual traditional bow. And I have a friend in um, New Mexico who shoots Mongolian horse bows. And uh, it just seemed like a wonderful thing. The problem was that I didn't buy arrows. 
And hmm. um, none of the arrows that I have are cut to the right length. They're not particularly straight. Um, you know, they're kitty arrows. And, mm-hmm. and so it turned out I have this beautiful, delightful little bow, and I have these dumb little um, wood arrows that, aren't really prepared and so I wind up um, not shooting it which is a terrible shame so I'm I'm going to be loaning it to a friend of mine um, because he wanted to experiment Um, like me he he wants to shoot every kind of bow he wants to get the feel for it and um, there's nothing like shooting a traditional classical bow to to bring home exactly what muscles you're using and and uh, the joy of it it's very pure Oh wow! I should, I should try one. Yeah, they're delightful. Wow. Well, thank you. And mm-hmm. how um, how does food affect you when you eat on, say, the day of the tournament? Um, because I was born with an enzyme deficiency, my muscles mm-hmm. can only process, um, can only burn protein and fat for um for for strength and so um i'm the opposite of a, a runner that would do a carbo load um yep. i avoid carbs as much as possible for a couple of days beforehand and most certainly before a shoot um i try to just give my body what it needs and so um protein and, and fat um a lot of people would be jealous i i can have ham and bacon and eggs and and things that other people would consider a heart attack on a plate is basically how I should eat all the time. Um, Just just to alleviate the boredom of it, um, I'll have a little fruit with it, but uh, it's really sad when I'll I'll go to a shoot and and a a club or a host has been very gracious and provided a a, um, what you would call a continental breakfast and it's bread 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 and I, bread and more bread yeah and i can't eat any of it um unless i want to make myself sluggish and sick to my stomach and and unable to shoot so i i just smile and um make sure that i get my sausage and my eggs before i go and and bring along a uh, banana or something and um for uh, for me, a a nice uh, by the way, I would dinner with I would uh, stay away from the bread too. So I'll just let you know. Oh oh yeah, because um, it it would sort of bring me down. Yeah, make me sluggish. Yeah, exactly. Um, a nice chicken fajita dinner with uh, guacamole, sour cream, a little bit of cheese. Uh, Lots, mm. lots of meat, a good amount of, of yummy fat, and very, very minimal um, carbs in just the uh, the tortilla and a little bit of grilled onions, and I'm perfect. You just made me really hungry. I know it's so okay. early. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's my go-to meal um, during during tournaments, uh, usually for dinner. But hey, you know if uh, if they if they're offering lunch on site, then I, I'll just have the hamburger without the bun, uh, mm-hmm. wrapped in some lettuce or something. You know, you you can work around it, but um, protein and fat is my thing. And then afterwards, um, something with milk to recover. Uh, for me, that's an an Atkins shake because I really like them. Um, but you know, regular old whole milk is terrific too. I honestly like the whole milk that's non-pasteurized and it still has the cream on top mm. and then have a bowl of ice cream and then take the cream and rip it up so it becomes whipped cream and then put oh. um, mm. frozen berries from you know in the winter I guess it's winter but yeah. from, from the freezer kind of thaw it out a little bit put it on it too and okay ladies and gentlemen this is not a shooting food <laughs> yeah. this is a you know Deluxe, sugar high, um, unhealthy, Ooh. wonderful treat. Yeah, I would go to um, dark chocolate for for the treat. It still has minimal sugar, um, mm-hmm. and and but I can still get that that um, satisfaction from it. I I actually mostly would too, because um, I 
I feel much better when I don't eat certain foods like dairy, wheat, processed foods. And when I eat more for myself, my body, protein, vegetables, um, it's like I, I feel clear. My brain feels clear. It's like exactly. And then I watch them at tournaments handing out pizza to everybody. I'm like, I am not touching. <laughs> well, well, and then, you know, people will try to be what they think healthy, and, and they'll hand me fruits or vegetables, and I'll just look at them like that's still carbs. Well, it's, it's they're, also they're, they're sugar, you know. So well, what do you and, do? And it is. Um, and it's like, you know, I, I know that you're being kind and thoughtful, and, and I really, really appreciate it, but... Fruits and vegetables are still carbs, and and so that's not going to do me any good. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. It gets really boring. It's what? It gets really boring. Oh, it's really boring. boring. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, I just mean um, I I feel guilty because it's boring for other people um, that, you know, um, I wish that I didn't have these strangenesses uh, in my genetic makeup and that I could just kind of dance along and and just go along with the group. Um, but uh, hydration is is really of utmost importance for me to try mm-hmm. and avoid injury and um, and the, the protein and fat thing. Oh, wonderful. Well, I just, what I have found myself in trying to eat clean over the past 10 years is mm-hmm. that we have a culture where um, food is a thing of offering as a gift, and then people are supposed to say, oh, thank you, and take the food. It's like this yeah. respect thing. So that's, I yeah. think, what I grew up on. And then when I started saying no, I'm like, this feels uncomfortable, but really empowering. It does. Because I feel much better. Oh, well, yeah, that too. Um, I, I try to, to always phrase it, you know, that I'm not judging what anybody else eats. Um, I, you know, that is so totally their decision and and their lifestyle and whatever makes them happy and and that they run well on is terrific but over time um and half of it accidentally um i've i've learned what my body needs and now Mm -hmm. it's like a religion and uh, and yes uh i run better on caffeine and so with it with no apologies whatsoever um, the the coffee or tea in the morning, um, right through until lunchtime, um, it makes the body run better. It makes the mind run better. And it's like, well, if somebody else can't process coffee, I'm sorry, but I can and do and enjoy every minute of it. Nice. <laughs> Especially this time of year, having hot cups of, oh, yeah, it makes you sort of feel warm and ready for winter. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I don't know about ready for winter part, but <laughs> what, what got you into the amazing sport of archery? Interested in, like, in competing, you mean? Or just interested at all? No, at all. Uh, well, the first introduction was um, when I went along with my daughter, and... Mm-hmm. And then a week later, when uh, when Alex got home from his business trip, and I said, "You have got to do this thing. You're going to love this." Um, oh. We learned after we started that mm-hmm. Alex's mom actually shot for the Stanford University archery team while she was there, and. Um, it was when we first started. We would go down um, the four of us on Tuesday nights. Um, my husband, myself, our daughter, and the person she was seeing, and so it was very much a a social thing. And you know, um, once your kids are adults and they've you know been out and gone to college and finished and are starting their lives, um, you maybe are at your low point of the things that you have in common with them. And mm-hmm. and so it was really wonderful to um, have something weekly. And we could all get together and we'd have dinner first and catch up on what we were all doing. And then we'd have to head up to the range. And on Tuesday night at b and it's stick bow night. And so we'd be there with the other recurve archers. And, and some people are shooting um, classic bear um, bows and, you know, all these different 
brands made out of all these different woods, and they're just beautiful works of art, um, as well as, you know, um, people of every age, every color, every size and shape. Um, it, it was very much a, an inclusive environment. And, and, you know, we're all giving each other a hard time because that's how we are and that's how we interact. And it's wonderful. We all celebrate our birthdays together. We have Christmas together. Um, we, we share each other's lives. And, and mm-hmm. so these friendships that, that we developed when we first started um, really, you know, it they, they draws you into the enjoyment of the sport. And then Alex and I found that as much as we love the social thing, that we just really wanted to get better. And so I started practicing during the day. Um, we elevated to a, a higher level coach. And and then we really started focusing on it. Um, and then spring came. We started shooting outdoors. And then we made more friends of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, people that shoot outdoors. And it's wonderful and it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> really, really hard. Um, and we both are naturally competitive people. Um, mm-hmm. For me, you know, um, I'm an extrovert. Everybody can see exactly how I am. Um, how, what you see is what you get. Alex is nicer, quieter, much more pleasant to be around, and he is every inch the competitor that I am, if not more. Um, and so um, the front end is different, but the back end is the same. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been married 26 years, and that has always been the truth. And so, um, you know, this is my spouse is my training partner. And uh, our friend is his coach. Um, my coach uh, is also um, friends with other people in the world that I'm friends with. So there's still a social aspect of spending time with people that we enjoy and respect and um, and have fun with, but also on another level of we just really want to get better. Mm-hmm. So that's wow. kind of where we are right now. We're developing. Um, Alex is way better than I am and always will be. Um, he's just naturally, uh, when he becomes interested in developing his skill at something, he becomes very, very good at it, whatever that is, um, softball, volleyball, and now archery. Um, with me, I'm I'm passionate, but because of my physical limitations, I will probably never, you know, become – Superwoman, um, but within the range of what I can do, then by heaven, I am going to find out where I can go with it. So it, it's it's a different kind of development for each of us, but um, yep. but we help each other every day, and everything that we learn, we share between us, and we respect that we do it differently. Our our technique and our preferred forms are very different. But his suits his physiology and psychology, and mine suits mine. Well, that that's important, and it's important. Mm-hmm. You, you guys just got a great relationship. That's just awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. And then it, there you go, listeners. I just took half a page of notes. I will <laughs> have at theflyingarcher.com, and you can follow Jen on her Twitter account and her Facebook, which will also be on theflyingarcher.com at my blog. And, uh, wow. Um, Jen, the time has just flown by. You've been an incredible guest. I have um, a couple more questions for you. What what was your early challenge in archery? If you have any. Hmm. Early on, uh, at first, I had no conditioning. Uh, my physical condition was was really weak, and so um, naturally uh, I went in without building myself up first, and so I, I had a dropped shoulder on the right side, and that kept me out for months. Um, once I learned how to shoot and use that uh, that back shoulder properly, then that was pretty much taken care of. Um, and then I had a um, 
a, a deltoid that I strained, and uh, and most recently it was uh, tennis elbow. So, um, conditioning, I would say, was my my earliest um, challenge in archery, and and my continuing challenge. Um, I really need to get stronger in in the muscles that support it, as opposed to the muscles to, that I use doing it. And that, and all of that is a really, really good point to have, you know, in that's muscle strength, strengthening for those that support the muscles that you're using and your muscles. I get people that come to my archery classes and go, oh, you know, I'm big and buff, I think, and I want to, hunting season is in three weeks, I want to do bow hunting, and I'm going to get a 60, 70 pound bow, and I look at them, I says, okay, here, pull back this 25 pound bow, and, uh-huh. and they're, they're getting like a leap, and I'm like, look, can, consider it uh training for like you're doing weight training would you go to the gym and pick up a 60 pound weight and do certain movement when you really are at 20 pounds does that make sense and then and then i say to them you know if you want to do the hunting well you know you got to be really good at archery you got to be you have one shot and one shot only to pretty much to for the kill and yep. so plan it out give yourself a year and get yeah. yourself strength training, a good coach, get your form good, you know, exactly. and then go out with your bow and arrow and do it the right way. So when I started, I said, this is a two year program um, because mm-hmm. I felt so behind the eight ball. It wasn't like I was starting out in good shape that I could even take a year to learn. I said, this is a two year program. And I'm only halfway through that, that two years to, to get up to speed. So I'm not, at where I hoped I would be because I've been sidelined with injuries half the time. But um, on the other hand, it's coming along. And um, I have a much clearer idea of what I need to do than when I started. And that's important. You have to know where you're going. You have to know what the goal is um, yes. in order to know how to, to, to plan the increments between here and there. I um, the, My favorite analogy is... Um, when I go to explain it and somebody say, oh, you're a silversmith, you have really strong arms, so that must be great. No. <laughs> I thought so too. No. Um, the, the best analogy I can think of is swing dancing. If anybody has done it, um, especially the West Coast swing, which is, is what I used to learn and teach, your arms are firm and flexible, yes, but you aren't using your arms. You're using your arms as a means to resist um, your partner to use your body to move back and forth. The arms are just the conduit. And so you don't want them to be so stiff that they um, are going to break, and you don't want them to be so loose that they can't um, sustain the, the pressure either. But they're just the conduit. They're not mm-hmm. what's making the motion. Your body is where the motion is and the movement is generated. Oh, or, what a great analogy! Thank you. Put, put a, hold a string, um, hold a spring between your hands, you know, mm-hmm. and and when you're pressing it, it's like you're really not pressing it with your arms. You're pressing it with your back, and then when you let it go, well, that's aiming, you know. So where are you going to shoot that thing? You know, um, you're going to shoot it up at the ceiling. You're going to just let it go with your thumb? No. You know, in order to, to, for it to go in the direction you want it to, it has to be sent there. That's, that's a great visual. Thank you for, for both of them. And what is the craziest thing that happened when you were shooting? I think you said something about at indoor nationals. Hmm. Oh, yes. At, at Indoor Nationals, um, the Masters were on the very end. Uh, we were on the last targets next to where the um, director of shooting and, and the timing mechanism were. And uh, Alex and I and Dean Villanueva and, and Sarah Hinkle were really enjoying shooting together. And I was utterly calm, in the zone, no sense of time whatsoever, and I I raised the bow. I let it go when I was ready. Um, by the time I got to the third, Alex is behind me about 
15 seats. Where He's where the chairs are. And he's trying to tell me, Jen, 30 seconds, you know, 20, 10. I can't hear him. He, I, mm-hmm. I'm just... I, I, I literally did not, I could hear that his voice was there, but I, I wasn't hearing what he was saying. I wasn't looking up at the clock. I was just taking my shot. And at the moment I released the arrow, the timer went off and the director of shooting stands up and shouts at me, you had about one second there. I, and then I was like, Deer in the headlights. Wow. I, I was just like, oh, oh God, oh God, oh God. Everybody's, um, mm. but um, the arrow landed within within the time. And uh, mm-hmm. after that, I tried to be a little bit more heads up about it. But um, yeah, that that the, that voice coming across from behind the other side of the table, um, it was quite a shock. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but so it's so cool. You're like totally in the moment. So what are you thinking about while you're in the rain shooting? I'm trying to achieve consistency. I'm trying to do it the same way every time. And of course, your muscles fatigue and your brain is going and um, it's hard to do it the same way every time. Um, Mm -hmm. It used to be that the first shot of every group would be great and then it would sort of degrade from there. Um, It's not necessarily the first shot anymore. Um, Sometimes it's the last one. But um, trying to achieve the muscle memory to not think about it. Just uh, I'm, I'm trying to gain the autopilot of a hula dancer's hips. Raise it the same way draw it the same way, anchor it the same way, get every angle, everything to be automatic so that by the time that I'm ready to check the alignment of my string and aim and let go, that I'm not tired, I'm not stressed, I'm not distracted, just just do it. Just let the arrow go, same way, every time. And that's what I'm trying to do. So what, what mental tricks would you have to offer another archer to help them focus? Mental tricks. Music helps. Uh, if, if someone can have the internal iPod playing something that uh, really works for them um, in the rhythm of their shot, um, that yeah, I can see you... some fast music too. too. <laughs> and well, arrows it's in not necessarily fast, um, but it does oh. have to be rhythmic. Yeah, and and on different days would be different songs. You know, some days you're really on top of it, and other days maybe you want to slow down a little bit. But uh, finding the 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 rhythm that works for you, um, and it's not a, a whole album. It's usually just a phrase because. You know, shooting is five or six, seven seconds tops. So, yeah, yeah you don't you don't need to have a three minute song there, um, unless unless that's what works for you. But um, playing the internal iPod, whatever um, gets that rhythm in in the right space for you. And then, of course, you're thinking about the music instead of obsessing about your shooting. And so that's what works for me. And, and everyone around you and stuff. For sure. How would you describe what it feels like to, to shoot an arrow? And this is to somebody who's never, ever done archery before. Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. It's power. Um, and for a small, disabled woman, a feeling of power is the best thing ever. Um, it's grace, and it's control, and it's joy and its power. Wow. Wow, Jen, thank you for being on the show. Could you um, leave us with a pearl of wisdom or inspiration that you would like us to hear? Oh, golly. Well, um, I, I'm, I never consider myself wise. I am 
strictly a novice at this, but um, what I say to everyone that they'll see me shooting and, and the reaction, or even if they just see my bow, like down, out at the hospital when I bring it with me, um, they, they're like, that's the coolest thing ever. And um, my watchwords are, if I can do this, anyone can do this. Uh, you don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a hunter. You don't have to be a child. Um, you can be any age, uh, at any stage in your physical development. You, you know, uh, some of the most amazing archers uh, ever shoot para, and they have all kinds of physical challenges that that just make minds dwarf into insignificance. So mm-hmm. that would be that would be my phrase. If I can do this, anyone can do this. And should. Who wouldn't want That's joy? Really good point. Um, and Jen, I, I want to again thank you for being on our show and and to our I'm listeners. Spend the time with you. Oh, thank you. It's been a total pleasure. And all of the links on our, our website and resources from this podcast will be posted on our website, theflyingarcher.com. Okay. Hey, awesome job. Yay. Yay, yes. <laughs> uh, your, your story is very empowering, and um, I think people will get a lot from it. I want to let you know. I hope so. I hope so, because because you know, um, I I I really genuinely um, you know I archery is an area of humility for me, you know I know just how much of a beginner I am and you know will always be, and uh, mm-hmm. in that in itself is um, is kind of a good thing for everybody to have something at which you are reminded that you're, you know, insignificant and developing, but still valuable. Every individual matters and, you know, every everybody's they they'll they'll joke about, you know, everybody's archery journey. But <laughs> um, they everybody has their own experience and they're all valid. I I hate the divisiveness of well, I, you know, I shoot this and everybody else is crap. Or, and then the, the complete, you know, people that, that shoot within um, the more commercial bows. I have friends that shoot horse bows at sticks from 100 yards and make those shots consistently. So, I mean, there are so many really great archers that you may never see on TV and they may be dressed in really interesting clothing. And they are better than anyone you'll ever meet. And they, you know, they're, it's a big tent. It's a really big tent. Wow, that's beautiful. 